Hi everyone, welcome back to Numinosophy Academy, I'm Lewis. Today I'm going to be jumping back on the Saints Unscripted YouTube channel in order to react to their video on blood atonement, which is a huge topic, so I'll just be giving you my preliminary thoughts. As always, if you do enjoy this content, please do like this video for the YouTube algorithm. Okay, so the title of today's video is Brigham Young and Blood Atonement. What's the deal? Question mark. And we will begin. All right, so before we get into this topic, I can't make this point strongly enough. How you react to things past prophets have said or done will largely depend on what your expectations of a prophet are. Latter-day Saints believe prophets are messengers of God, but they are not God's sock puppets. They are products of their culture. They can have their own beliefs, opinions, personality, and teaching style. They can express their own ideas about God and be wrong. <coughs> oh, David. Okay, we're getting back into this claim that has been made on many Saints Unscripted episodes, that you can make a sharp distinction between um, the opinions of prophets and the doctrine of the church. This sharp distinction just doesn't hold up. It's very unclear where the, the line should even, should even go. So, you know, is it only doctrine if it appears in scripture, if we can find it in Doctrine and Covenants? Or is it doctrine if a prophet emphatically claims it to be doctrine? Or what if they never claim it to be doctrine, but they just teach it as if it is the truth of the church? Or does it matter how the community, how the church as a, as a whole receive that doctrine? What if it's taught as doctrine, but the church collectively rejects it as doctrine? Or what if something is taught as truth, but it's never stated to be doctrine, and again, the church just follows it as if it were doctrine. You see, it's very unclear where that line should be should be drawn. And you know, we don't just have to be uh, hypothetical about this. You know, take polygamy as a as an obvious um, example. In the Doctrine and Covenants, prior to the uh, 1876 edition, this is what um, section 101 said. It said, inasmuch as the Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and that one woman but one husband, except in the case of death, when either is at liberty to marry again. Now, this was in Doctrine and Covenants until 1876 which is after Joseph Smith has died, after he's had all his plural wives. This is after Brigham Young has had all his plural wives. This is after the Mormon Reformation, in which polygamy is being encouraged within Utah. So polygamy is, you know, common practice. And yet the doctrine of the church in Co Doctrine and Covenants states emphatically that they teach and practice monogamy, which is not true. And that is the case with the teaching we will be getting onto, Blood Atonement, that, you know, Brigham Young just did state simply that it was a doctrine. However, the kind of underlying point that I think David was making, that individuals and prophets of the past shouldn't be judged by the moral standards of today, I broadly agree with that, you know, just as long as we're being open and transparent about what was believed and taught in the past. Okay, so boo to the sharp distinction. It just doesn't work. They can even have personal biases and prejudices that may seem appalling to us today. But we do not consider everything said from the pulpit to be the doctrine of our faith. For example, in Utah, during the excitement incident to the coming of Johnston's army, Brother Brigham preached to the people in a morning meeting a sermon vibrant with defiance to the approaching army and declaring an intention to oppose and drive them back. In the afternoon meeting, he arose and said that Brigham Young had been talking in the morning, but the Lord was going to talk now. He then delivered an address, the tempo of which was the opposite from the morning talk. If you have the expectation that everything ever spoken by general authorities of our church is the will of God, you're going to be sorely disappointed. B. H. Roberts went so far as to say that even Mormon leaders have given utterance to ideas that are indefensible. Brigham Young, by his own admission, had an unruly tongue, and he sometimes purposefully made his sermons abrasive so people would pay attention. And that style of preaching wasn't unusual in that era. 19th century Americans were accustomed to violent language. So, to what extent is that fair? That we can just say that the, the rhetoric um, that, that constituted 19th century sermon giving just was inflammatory by nature. 
Yeah, that does seem fair. Um, I think extreme language was used within Mormonism, outside of Mormonism. Again, I just think it's about, it's about transparency, isn't it? It's about stating clearly what was said in the past and stating that today we do not stand by those, um, you know, opinions taught. I think it's just about transparency, really, isn't it? We need to be able to state clearly what was said in the past and be able to state clearly why that is not what we believe and teach today. Religious and otherwise. Throughout the century, revivalists had used violent imagery to encourage the unconverted to repent and to urge backsliders to reform. So while people outside the church from then until now have had a heyday with some of Brigham's statements, <laughs> the saints understood that there was little bite to his celebrated bark. The Mormon membership came to tolerate, expect, and even enjoy the show. So, but where that gets slightly complicated, of course, is if I make some um, inflammatory statement, right? If I say that this group of people, this particular group of people should die, right? And I state that from the pulpit. And then a member of my uh, church community then goes out and kills a person in that group. Would I not be partly culpable for that move? I mean, that gets us very close to current affairs, actually, which I'm, and I'm not going to go there. But it, it doesn't feel that, um, you know, Brigham Young can completely wash his hands of the sins um, orchestrated by his members, you know, if indeed any such sins were committed. So while some of Brigham's views were definitely just wrong, it's important to understand his teaching style and relationship with the saints. They gave him a lot of slack. Brigham Young identified greatly with the Old Testament and even came to be known as the American Moses. He led the saints on an exodus to their promised land in the West where he established a theocracy similar to Moses and the Israelites. Here we will build the temple of our God. Some of his teachings also had an Old Testament flavor. For example, the Law of Moses ascribes a death sentence to a wide variety of sins or crimes. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Brigham Young also expressed some intense opinions in that regard. He and a few other leaders shared their belief that some sins were so bad that Christ's atonement would not cover them. And in a true theocracy like that of Moses and the Israelites, the only way to atone for them would be for you to willingly have your blood shed. Those... So, I mean, he hasn't really even explained what blood atonement is, but blood atonement is just basically the idea that some people can commit um, sins so atrocious that the um, atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross um, cannot cover those particular sins. So, you know, the question is, first of all, are people choosing for themselves to be blood atoned or are they being blood atoned, you know, are we choosing to blood atone them? And that's the difference between perhaps someone uh, choosing a form of capital punishment for themselves, which results in their blood being spilt in order for that to be blood atonement, um, or are we saying that person is a sinner and going out and killing them? And the the rhetoric of Brigham Young definitely did suggest that going out and killing people. The question is, did that actually happen? Who will not live by the law shall die by the law. Run. This was called blood atonement. The and then the, the secondary point is um, what sins do we consider to be so atrocious? And the list for that given by early prophets, by Brigham Young, um, by early apostles seems to be very long. You know, murder is a kind of obvious one, um, but it goes way beyond that. Uh, it can include uh, theft, um, it can include uh, sexual immorality, prostitution. It would include um, kind of racist views as well. So um, having sex with the, uh, you know, with black people. I actually have a, a quote here, um, which I can read to you. Shall I tell you the law of God? 
in regard to the African race. If a white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, which is to say a black person, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. So what constitutes a sin so bad that um, Jesus's atoning sacrifice cannot cover it? Well, it encompasses a lot, it seems. The obvious problem with this idea, first and foremost, is that it limited Christ's atonement. Now, the scriptures do talk about the unforgivable sin or sins that are unto death, but the Lord will forgive whom he will forgive. That's not our call to make. Out of Brigham Young's 390 speeches in the Journal of Discourses, I've been able to track down five that clearly talk about blood atonement in reference to murder, breaking temple covenants, adultery, and interracial marriage. What? Again, as B.H. Roberts mentioned, some of these statements are simply indefensible, so I'll make no effort to do so. How about new? Now, was anyone ever actually blood atoned by order of Brigham or the church? Well, it depends on who you ask. There are a handful of noticeably unverifiable campfire stories which you are free to believe, or you can remain skeptical. So that is really the, the key qualifier to that sentence, that were ordered by um, Brigham Young. Because this, you know, it gets down to the kind of complicated arguments around um, incitement of violence. You know, as I was saying earlier, you know, are you to some degree culpable if you say, um, you know, that someone that has interracial sex should be killed if one of your members then goes out and does that? Are you not culpable? Yeah, I think you are culpable, at least to some degree. Um, but, you know, that will depend on a case-by-case -case basis, the extent to which your um, culpability would, would apply. That said, as of right now, there is no actual evidence that anyone at any time was ever blood atoned by order of Brigham or the church. Of course, for years, antagonists of the church have tried to paint early Utah as a bloodbath where you'd be secretly killed for almost anything, ignoring the money. Yeah, so I think this actually does, uh, is a slight defense of um, early practices. You know, they're in Utah, they're on the frontier, so, you know, there's definitely kind of frontier justice taking place. You know, if you have, um, if you don't have a kind of intact legal system like we have today, then you need to have far higher penalties for much smaller crimes in order to, to maintain order and control. And so, you know, the idea that um, you might, you know, in the kind of Old Testament sense, argue for murder for what today would seem like um, minor misdemeanors, you know, it, it seems much more reasonable on the frontier, uh, it seems to me. Minor detail in this teaching, if it had been operable, that the perpetrator must have their blood shed willingly. So I'd say the only noticeable effect this teaching had was that it probably bolstered support in the early church for legal capital punishment, and it's been a source of confusion for some people. It even yeah, but it should also be clarified what type of capital punishment, because it's specifically capital punishment in which blood is spilt. And so hanging doesn't do that because no blood is spilt. So you need to either be shot or decapitated. And that might sound extreme, but there is a lot of early Mormon literature talking about um, decapitating people for, you know, particular uh, sins. So um, in terms of decapitation being a corporal punishment on the books of Utah, that really was the case. It was an allowable corporal punishment um, in 19th century Utah. Even leaders over the years, but that's about it. It's my opinion that the lack of evidence attests to the fact that the saints understood that Brigham was not telling them to go out and start killing people. I shouldn't do it. B.H. Roberts had a similar opinion. Fortunately, the suggestions seemingly made in the overzealous words of some of these leading elders were never acted upon. The church never incorporated them into her polity. Indeed, it would have been a violation of divine instruction given in the new dispensation had the church attempted to establish such procedure. The church has denounced this teaching. We believe that the atonement of Jesus Christ is efficacious for anyone and everyone who repents of their sins. So that's also interesting because you know, it's trying to kind of paint it as if 
Brigham Young hold this uh, indefensible position, but of course we in the modern world certainly would never believe such a barbaric thing. Well, I have another quote for you. Um, this is a quote from uh, Bruce R. McConkie, and this is only 1958, so really not that long ago. Under certain circumstances, there are some serious sins for which the cleansing blood of Christ does not operate. And the law of God is that men must have their own blood shed to atone for their sins. In other words, blood atonement was being believed and taught in the 1950s. So it's not a case that this is just, you know, archaic views being, you know, taught in the 19th century. No, no, this is, you know, mid 20th century. These same beliefs continue to be taught. It could be that there are some sins that cannot fully be repented of in this life, but God is the judge and we're going to let him figure out how to handle those situations. Check out the links and notes in the description. Okay, well that's just a get out statement, isn't it? He didn't really set out what the doctrine even was, clearly, and, you know, then he just kind of jumped straight into, you know, defend the idea that it's possible to still claim that these people are prophets, although they're, even though they're teaching certain ideas to be doctrine. So, for example, here's a quote from um, Brigham Young. I know when you hear my brethren telling about cutting people off from the earth, i.e. killing them, that you consider it as strong doctrine but it is to save them, not to destroy them, right? So note there, he understands blood atonement to be doctrine. This is not just his opinion. And furthermore, I know that there are transgressors who if they knew themselves and the only condition upon which they can obtain forgiveness would beg in their brethren to shed their blood. I will say further, I have had men come to me and offer their lives to atone for their sins. So this is saying not only is blood atonement defensible um, in terms of a godly principle, but that it's even a loving thing to do, a brotherly thing to do, something that your brother would even ask of you if it assured their salvation. So it was a doctrine, and it continues, it seems, from uh, you know David's kind of get-out statement there at the end, to be believed on some level that there are certain sins so indefensible that the blood of Jesus cannot atone for it. And I guess that probably ties in to the uh, sons of perdition type idea that you can commit some sins that are so indefensible that you become a son of perdition, you become an angel of Satan. Okay, well, thanks for watching. A bit of a bleak episode, this one. Um, as always, thanks to my Patreon supporters, um, whose help is very much um, appreciated. Thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, please do share this video, like the video for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Cheers again, and I will see you in the next one.